Hello and welcome back to another episode of Being Woodworking. This video, I'm going to share just tips and tricks. Not an entire project. Some of the most useful tips that I've learned. I'm going to save the best one for last. Let's get started. Starting out with the mixing. The most bubbles get introduced into the epoxy while mixing the epoxy as a general rule of thumb. You want to mix it in a container that allows you the deepest amount. I might have a project that could fill a small cup, halfway fill a small bucket, a quarter of a large bucket. The point is, is think about the mixing paddle that you're using and the depth. If it's, if your mixing paddle is halfway exposed to the air, not even all the way in the epoxy, you're going to have a ton of bubbles. And yes, you can deal with it. Or you can not deal with it and not have to deal with it. So my point is, if I was going to choose between these two buckets and I could have a mix of 22 ounces to here or 22 ounces to here, I'm going to choose this one. Choosing your mixing paddles. This was my go-to forever, just a normal paint mixer. This one is a cheaper one that you get at your local box store. This one has no spiral to it. No, what's the word I'm looking for? No helix to it. It doesn't pull it down, it doesn't push it up, it simply spins. This one I've used more often than this one here recently. It doesn't create as much of a vortex sucking air down into the epoxy while I'm mixing it as this one does. In the deep buckets, the five gallon buckets, the big buckets, yeah, I'll use this one, no problem. I also picked up this very cheap one. This one's the least expensive out of all of them and I use this one a lot because now this one, it does have fan blades which would be the equivalent of a helix. So this one I use on my deep buckets. This one I use in my deep buckets with a shallower level in it or just my smaller buckets. And this one I use in my very small cups and my very shallow pours. So this one fits in my very small cups. So if I'm just mixing maybe a color and I had the whole mix in there, I'll use this. Like so. Man, eh, you know, you see what I'm saying. Now it's a habit of people to clean up the area before they pour. They'll run the vacuum, they'll sweep, they'll do this and that. Great theory, bad practice. When you clean right before you pour, you're introducing dust into the air. You'll get these fine, they're not hairs, they're more like filaments. I call them squigglies. And those squigglies will float around the air for hours. And then after you're done with your project and you're sitting and you're letting it cure and you come back a couple hours later and check on it, there'll be a little squiggly in your epoxy. So, one, don't clean up right before your project. Clean up the day before or two days before and let that area rest. Two, if you do get a squiggly, how do you fix it? Well, what I do, I keep around in my shop a couple of these very inexpensive little knives that you get at any dollar store, box store, feed store. They're a dollar, a couple dollars. And I would just use the point to dig out that squiggly. And you can wipe it on your plastic, on your tabletop, and be done with it. In the process of babysitting your project and getting squigglies out, you may introduce more squigglies. If you have pets, if you don't have pets, you can still do it. I keep these around. I keep several of these in my shop and I will leave them around my work area while I'm doing a project. And before I ever get started on a project, it doesn't matter if I'm wearing short sleeves or long sleeves. If, if my skin is exposed, I will still rub this over my skin. I will do all my clothing. And clean everything real good because when I'm leaning over a project, 
you don't want one of these little fibers, little hairs, something falling into your project that you then have to clean up later. So these are a lifesaver. Before you ever get started on your project, fill a spray bottle with water. The spray bottle, you want to make sure that it can shoot a very fine mist into the air. So if you go around your area, your room, and spray a fine mist of water into the air, what it's going to do is the water will attach to any of those little squigglies or little items floating around in the air and it will weigh them down. After you spray this water, give it a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and you're ready to start working. It's currently winter and I'm about to start working on a project. I have to heat this room to keep it in a temperature that is conducive for my epoxy to cure. I don't want it to get below 65 degrees. I prefer it to be between 70 and 75 degrees. The most common way to heat a room is positive pressure air, meaning something is blowing air into the room. If that's your only option, then fine, do it. What I recommend are radiator heaters. Radiator heaters put out heat and they don't have a fan blowing air around, they just introduce heat. So I have two of them hooked up right here beside my project. The main source of heat is a window unit that I have in my shop. My radiator heaters aren't going to be able to keep up while the temperature is very cold. Today it's about 36 degrees outside. Tonight it's going to get down lower. So I'm going to have to use my window unit. But what I have done is I have gotten a large section of uh, styrofoam insulation. It can be the same insulation that you use when you're cutting things on your board. You don't want to use that one because of all the sawdust. You want to use a separate one. But I'm going to turn the camera around and I'm going to show you I have put this up in front of my window unit and braced it so it's not going to move. So now when the window unit blows air, it's going to hit that insulation and it's going to go out. So there's my window unit and there is my air block. Let's get back to the mixing part. A habit that I myself have had to force myself to break is when I mix something up in one bucket and whether I'm pouring that whole bucket out or if I'm pouring into the other buckets, a habit of mine is to grab a paint scraper, some kind of scraper, scrape the sides, get all that product out, and pour it into the project or into another bucket. We don't want to waste money, right? This stuff is not cheap, it's expensive. But if there is anywhere where you're going to have unmixed product or unproperly mixed product, it is more likely to be on the walls of your container than anywhere else in your mix. So if you're going to do that, you need to make very sure that you have scraped the sides of your container while mixing it very well. If you have any doubt, don't scrape that product into your project. I put this one in my shop. I don't put it directly in front of a heat source or by a heat source. I put it out of the way so that I can keep track of what the temperature is in my shop. If this thing gives me reason to pause or worry, then I start pausing and worrying. I'm going to do this countertop and then I'm going to do another countertop and it needs to match pretty much exactly. Maybe not the design, but the colors need to match. So if I'm creating a piece of granite, quartz, marble, and uh, this kitchen has three, four different areas, we want to put out the highest quality that we can. You cannot replicate exactly the same color scheme if you're just grabbing a bag of color and sprinkling it, pinching it, whatever you're doing, into your mix. You need to be able to measure it. Measuring spoon. Grab this, get your powder, and put it in. That's great if you're working with a dry additive. What if you're using a wet additive, such as a dye? A lot of these dyes, if you open them correctly, you can literally measure drops like an eyedropper on how much you put into a mix. When you're doing this, be sure and write down your recipe. If I'm putting five drops of white into 22 ounces of epoxy, I want to remember that. Then if I'm not using 22 ounces of epoxy, 
on the next area that I'm using or working on, well, and then I can create a ratio. I might need seven drops. I might need four drops. I might need four and a half. If your dye does not come out cleanly in drops, you can go to the pharmacy and you can get needles and syringes. And then you can draw out of your dye exactly how much you want and put it in there. And again, record this. Get scratch paper, get a notebook, something where you write down how much you're putting in there. That way you have a ratio. This much color, this much product. This much color, this much product. Simple. I like to use a heat gun that has an adjustable heat dial. Most of the time I keep it on max. Occasionally, I want to turn down the heat and keep the same volume of air going through it. If I'm fanning something out, I'm afraid of scorching my epoxy. So I can do that. I'm not a real big fan of the torches that just have something that sits on top of a bottle and holding the bottle and moving it around. I like this. This has a belt clip where I can hold it in a holster and I can move it around. But I feel like I have much more control over this. I really like it. The only thing that I've had to keep up with and had a problem with is this hose touching my product. That's where the holster comes in really handy. I can have the holster around behind me. I can bring this up over my shoulder or I can hold it in my off hand while I'm working with this hand. Scraping drips. I first started out just using paint sticks. I found out that I really didn't use that. Sometimes you get a little behind or you don't check on it soon enough and they're starting to gel up and they're starting to gum up. I stole a very cheap butter knife out of the kitchen and I will use the back side of it to scrape those drips and that scrape just comes right off and then drips down on my plastic. Make sure that your bucket is clean before you mix in it and make sure the outside of the bucket is clean before you mix in it because guess what you're gonna hold this bucket over your product while you're pouring it. I said that wrong. Guess what? You're gonna hold this bucket over your project while you're pouring your product. Hey, I said it right that time. So I have made that mistake. I've cleaned up the inside. A little bit of dust or sawdust on the outside, eh, what's the big deal? And then yeah, I have to dig the sawdust out of my project later. And it's not fun, it's aggravating. In stone coat countertops and in most epoxies, you're going to have one that's thin. It pours almost like water. Um, then you're going to have another one that pours more like half set up jello. I put the thin one in first. So when I'm pouring in the thicker one, it's not mounding up and hard to measure. If that's the first one you're putting in there, you either have to wait for a long time for it to level, and sometimes you have air bubbles down in there where if it folded over on itself, if you put in the thinner one and then put the thicker one in, it's a lot easier to measure. That thin one will displace and you'll have an accurate measurement of your product inside of your bucket. And finally, the one thing that I keep going in my shop, almost 24-7, 365, because not only does it help me with my epoxy, my epoxy projects, it helps me with my woodworking projects and all the finishes that I do. And it is so simple. That joker right there has saved my projects more than anything else. I had several projects when I first started where I didn't have one of these and I continually pulled bugs out of my projects. The epoxy lays down very shiny. If you leave your shop lights on then your epoxy becomes a light source with the reflection and the bugs are literally attracted to it and once they touch it that's right. They're in it forever. They're not coming out until you get them out. And if it happens after you have thought that it's safe to go to sleep or it's safe to leave it and you're good for a while, you may have to dig that bug out of cured epoxy and re-pour all over again. Terrible thing to have to do when you think you're already done. This thing, oh boy, it does great. And you never realize how many bugs are coming in your shop when you open and close the door until you have one of these and you hear it pop. If there's one tip that you take away from this entire video, let that be the one. 
keep one of these in your work area. These are made for being inside. Of course, you want to keep them safe from kids. There is danger. You want to be careful where you put it. As far as epoxy, as far as finishes that go on projects, that's my best tip for not messing them up after you do them.